It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, exciting to come back to Ashland for a, a Gardner Angus Ranch sale and exciting to see a lot of familiar faces out there this evening. Um, just uh, again, we want to spend a few minutes, Mark asked uh, that we come and kind of visit a little bit about some of the, the new things going on in terms of technology and, and some of the selection tools that are available, some of the selection tools that, uh, that the Gardner Angus Ranch is, is using quite heavily to leverage uh, the, the strong genetic uh, packages they have here and provide even a better opportunity for, for you all as customers to, to select genetics uh, with a great deal of confidence. I think it, this all plays off of the fact that uh, this is all built on a very strong foundation. Uh, I don't know, you probably saw the Gardner newsletter uh, that, or a copy of the recent Beef Magazine that talked about uh, the last 50 years in the beef industry and some of the the changes that we've seen and even more importantly some of the people that have had a huge impact uh, some of the people that are very familiar at Gardner Angus Ranch Henry and and all of his family as well as a lot of other people associated with Gardner Angus Ranch with the Angus breed and with the American Angus Association that over time have laid a very strong foundation for what we do today. And so I think it's important to, to keep that in mind that, that the things we do, the tools we have, the technology that's available to us today is really we're building off of that foundation and trying to take advantage of, of newer information and more information to make uh, more reliable selection decisions as we go down the road. You know, when we talk about performance information, again, in, in laying that foundation, we, we look at the performance database uh, at the American Angus Association. And, and it's kind of interesting when we're talking about 50 years and celebrating 50 years, this is kind of a picture of what the weaning weight performance database looked like at the American Angus Association in 1963. It was a little over 8,000 weaning weights. We were processing, we, that was the second year of the performance programs of American Angus, and we, we saw about 4,000 weaning weights each year that had been processed by Angus breeders to start to characterize Angus genetics for important economically relevant traits. Started out with just birth weight and weaning weight were the first, the first traits that were really uh, utilized. If you look up there at the right side then of that graph, you see that uh, as of today, that database consists of a little over eight million weaning weight records on Angus cattle that are in that database. And so it's taking that foundation, continuing to build that information and grow that information. With genetic evaluation, we've gone from, from a simple uh, evaluation of sire progeny uh, that started uh, back in the 70s, early 70s, with some of the first field summaries and, and sire evaluation reports based on structured data that came out of programs like the Gardner Angus Ranch, to today we now do an evaluation every week on performance data that comes in to the American Angus Association. Uh, just this week, uh, the records that went into the EPDs that went live on Friday morning, every Friday morning, new EPDs, uh, there were nearly 8,000 weaning weights in this week's record. So it, it shows uh, the dedication of Angus breeders, many in the, in the room here today, and, and how important that information has become in making genetic improvement for our beef industry. You know, this is a, a, an example out of the sale catalog that you've all got in front of you. And, and we could spend uh, literally a day just going through the different pieces of information, uh, the different components of these selection tools that go into this. Uh, the catalog also has got a couple pages dedicated to really describing these different traits and giving you definitions on how to use that information. But we really want to go from this foundation of, of information 
information that we've got available here and kind of talk about some of the new technology and new direction that we're going today. So EPDs as we know them, EPDs on, on all of these animals out here in the sale uh, represented in that catalog are based on this basic information. That's uh, the pedigree of that animal, the ancestral information, the individual performance data on that animal, and ultimately the progeny as that animal becomes a parent, that progeny's data as well. Well, in today's industry, today's era, we actually are using additional information in the genomic data or the DNA tests that are available to help provide further information, further accuracy, further reliability in those EPDs. We still are, are focused on those EPDs and those accuracies that are calculated. They're in the traits that we understand. In the language, we know what they mean, but we're taking this extra piece of information, the genomic data, and incorporating that in as well. And so that's where we want to kind of talk about that a little bit as, as we go this evening. Again, DNA and the use of that technology is not new. I mean, we've seen it on TV. We watch uh, CSI, and in, in the matter of an hour, they can identify off of this little little speck of blood who the killer was uh, in that in that episode. It's not quite that easy. Any of you who have collected DNA samples know that uh, you can get bad samples and don't get test results. Mark, you've had a few rejected, I would guess. But uh, again, it, it's technology that's proven. It's science that's proven. We see it used in other, other industries, uh, the dairy industry, the swine industry. We see it used in, in pets, uh, this example of, of dogs, uh, that you can actually take a DNA test on a dog and identify the pedigree or the ancestral or breed makeup of that dog. And of course, we start to see more and more information of DNA technology being used on the human side to again, help, uh, help identify uh, genomic contributions that, that might, uh, cause disease resistance or, or cause some kind of implications there. And so it's technology that's sound and the science that's used. When we talk about the DNA technology that goes into the EPDs, we're gonna talk about some things, uh, some terminology, we're gonna talk about SNPs. SNPs are, are just a, a marker in that genome that, uh, that is identifiable by in a couple different forms uh, on that animal. And so what we're basically doing when we're taking genomic information off of 50,000 SNPs with an HD50K, for example, is we're, we're really looking at the impact that each one of those SNPs has for a particular trait. And so we go through, we add up the pluses and the minuses for for all of those SNPs across that animal's uh, genomic test, and that, that summation of all of those uh, pieces are what the genomic breeding value, or, or how we identify uh, the genomic potential that that particular animal has for that particular trait. And so we talk about SNPs, that's all we're looking at is really the impact that each of those SNPs might have on a, an individual trait, like marbling, for example. So once we get that genomic piece or that genomic information, we turn around and incorporate that into the EPD structure, just like we said earlier, where we look at the, the pedigree, the individual performance information, in terms of carcass genetic evaluation. So when we look at traits like carcass weight, ribeye, marbling, fat thickness, we're really using three different sources of data. We're using the harvest data, so the actual carcass data collected in a, in a packing plant and, and taking actual ribeye measurements on those carcasses and marbling scores, et cetera, tied back to the animals identified in our database that have harvest data collected. We have ultrasound measures, uh, over one and a half million ultrasound measures that have been taken on Angus animals, yearling bulls and yearling heifers are included in that database, including that evaluation. 
And then today we also use the DNA or the genomic information represented by uh, nearly 70,000 animals that have had some type of DNA test run on them that goes into that genetic evaluation. So those carcass EPDs that you see in that sale catalog have that complete set of information included in them each week that's applied and put into those EPDs. So when we think about using genomics, uh, it's, it's a tool, again, uh, you're very fortunate that, that progressive breeders have taken this technology and, and leveraged that technology in their programs to help give you more confidence in the genetics that you're purchasing. So we take that information again with the rapid weekly genetic evaluation and we, we take that information and are able to really give you much more reliable EPDs, more reliable information on animals at a much earlier age and to, to really help to identify what traditionally had been groups of cattle that it, it, you had to wait until they became parents to get much additional information on. Uh, the genomic tests allow you to uh, get a better sense of that animal's true genetic potential early on in life. And so it helps to really establish a stronger foundation for those genetic predictions that, uh, that you all rely on. Again, this is a nice little example. Uh, if you look in the sale catalog, you'll see a lot of animals that have had a genomic test run on them. And rather than having an I and a .05 accuracy on that EPD, we're actually generating a, a true or an NCE generated EPD for traits like marbling and ribeye. And you're gonna see those accuracies bump up into the .25 to .35 range, which is more like you would see on a bull that's, that's got his initial proof or initial progeny proof included in that genetic evaluation. That's kind of what this chart says, and it may be a little hard to see from the back, but basically it's a breakdown of traits uh, that you have EPDs on and shows if I use a HD50K genomic test, what the progeny equivalent for each of those different traits would be by having that information. So it allows me on one of these yearling bulls out here to really look with a genomic influenced EPD, the equivalency of having 21 calves for calving ease direct with a record in the genetic evaluation. So it really, uh, it helps to accelerate or really kickstart that genetic prediction. It builds more confidence in those animals' predictions to know what their true genetic merit is gonna be, rather than in many times on an ET calf, just basing that off of simply an average of the sire and the dam. So it's, it's more aggressive information that gives you more reliability and less risk associated uh, with that prediction. Turned around on the other side of the equation from a female standpoint, uh, with those kind of numbers, uh, it's easy to understand that uh, by testing a young female, uh, uh, an open heifer even, we have as much information on that, that cow in terms of her genetic contribution as we might gather if we uh, let her have a lifetime of natural calves. And so it's, uh, it's again, accelerating uh, the rate of selection, the rate of change that we can make by using uh, these genomic tools as, as we see today. You know, one of the things we, we see, uh, again, is a, an evolution of this technology and an improvement of this technology. We've got a, had a strong relationship uh, with Zoetis uh, and some of the research scientists there in, in developing the 50K uh, genetic tool. Uh, Kevin Milner's here this evening with Zoetis and we'll have a chance to uh, visit with Kevin over the next couple days uh, if you have any questions. But 
With that, we, we go through uh, periodically an upgrade or you have a phone or you have a computer that you get a software update on. That's really what we're doing with, in the process of doing right now with the genomic information. Uh, when that was first rolled out uh, a couple years ago, it was based on about 2,500 animals that were used to develop that equation, develop that that genomic prediction, and then that information is, is then applied to additional animals as they're tested. Well, last January, we released the second calibration, calibration two, we called it. It included uh, about 12,000 registered Angus animals that were used in the training population to, to recalculate that, that equation that those animals go through. And then all of those animals that previously had been done are run through those equations because we get better correlations, we get more information uh, that, that has a positive impact on those genomic predictions by using a larger population to retrain those. And then right now we're in the process of what we're calling calibration three, uh, which is including uh, nearly 40,000 animals in that uh, recalculation uh, process. And so uh, Dr. Sally Northcutt, who guides that uh, that team uh, of, of individuals at our office working on this in collaboration with the research uh, folks at Zoetis. Uh, we're right in the middle of this. This will be released in early December with the big uh, EPD update at that time. And so animals that are 50K tested, again, will see a software upgrade at that point in time. But you all won't really notice anything because we're really focusing still on the EPDs and the accuracies of those individual animals rather than looking at the detailed genomic information. Another exciting thing at the Angus Association in terms of evolution that we've seen over the last 50 years, uh, you know, we used to rely heavily on using universities to calculate the EPDs that were used by Angus breeders. We would uh, once a year initially, then to twice a year, would package up that data, that set of weaning data, for example, and ship it off to the University of Georgia or to Iowa State University where the universities we were involved with. Uh, we would bring that information back after they spent a month or two calculating EPDs, send it back to us, and then we we eventually, in, in the early 2000s, switched over uh, about 10 years ago to where we're doing all of that uh, genetic evaluation work in-house now. That has also allowed us to do it on a more frequent basis or a weekly basis now rather than once a year, uh, which was initially done. Likewise, with the genomic information, we had relied on companies like Zoetis and GeneSeq to provide a genomic mater uh, molecular breeding value or molecular value prediction to us that we then put into the EPD calculations. But through a collaboration with Zoetis, we now have that uh, that algorithm in-house that we're using, uh, we get actually the raw SNP data uh, comes in from the lab, from our lab partners. We run that through the equations and ultimately, again, turn that information into uh, the genomic enhanced EPDs that you, that you use in the sale catalog today. So again, a lot of new science, new technology, most of it you don't know is really happening or going on because you can still use with re great reliability those genetic predictions uh, that you're used to using from the Angus breed. So again, just kind of wrapping up this part, the big picture, uh, really the impact of genomic results uh, have on uh, the, the EPD system is it allows us to really accelerate genetic improvement, it allows us to, to really identify at a young age animals uh, that are, are more superior in genetic makeup or inferior for certain traits, and to try to make those selections uh, more reliable, having less risk as we go down the road. 
You know, we see genomics has really become really standard operating procedure uh, in the beef industry here in the last year or two, I think, is, is an understatement. Uh, whether it's sire selection, uh, we see uh, seed stock producers, we see AI studs, uh, they really are going to want these genetic predictions influenced by the genomic data uh, when they look at those individual animals. This is a slide that I stole off of Mark from one of his talks, uh, just in terms of str strategies of how you can use this information to, to again, refine your selection decisions uh, to, to have more confidence in the animals that you may put into an ET program, for example. And so there's a lot of different strategies being used on this technology and how to, how to really impact the genetics uh, that are going out and influencing the Angus breed. You know, we've got a big industry. It's a, it's a very complex industry. And when you think about the different parts of, of that uh, industry and where genetics uh, fit into uh, from a seed stock standpoint, how that influenced the cow-calf producer, ultimately uh, going through the stocker and feedlot phase, the packer all the way uh, through to the consumer. We're very fortunate uh, later this evening to hear from some people out of those segments of the industry that can, can help to uh, describe how this kind of technology can influence uh, those different pieces. And, and I think that's how we've tried to approach uh, genomic technology as well. We, we've really started out focusing on the seed stock side of the business and, and producers like Gardner Angus Ranch, how they can make more reliable selection decisions, resulting in better genetics uh, for you, their customers. But I think the next step naturally was to take some of this technology and apply it to the commercial cattle industry. More importantly, Angus Influence Cattle that, that we were interested in talking about. And, and that's where a product like GeneMax was developed, again, in collaboration with uh, Angus Genetics Incorporated, uh, Certified Angus Beef, and Zoetis. Uh, GeneMax was released uh, just about uh, 20 months ago to, uh, to begin to influence uh, Angus Influence cattle uh, from and providing a tool that could help to uh, improve selection decisions along those lines. Again, when we look at the traits for Gene Max, we're talking about two traits primarily. We're looking at gain and we're looking at marbling or, or what influences quality grade. And so those are two very important segments uh, of the industry and, and two very important traits that uh, have great economic impact on our industry. And so we know we're, we're accounting for some of the information uh, from genetics. Uh, some of that information or variation is, is impacted by environment and management, but uh, if we can better define the genetic contribution uh, that those cattle have, then I think it's a very important thing to consider. Again, so GeneMax is a DNA test. It was uh, really uh, developed for commercial cattle sired by registered Angus bulls. It's, uh, as I mentioned, considers marbling and post weaning gain as the two traits that we're really looking at. And it's been used, I'd say, quite heavily on the female side to, to try to help identify replacement females that can go back into uh, the commercial herds and, and have a positive impact from a genetic contribution standpoint on, on the, those programs. Uh, why is that important? I mean, all we have to do is look at the bottom line. This is some information uh, supplied to us uh, from our friend Tom Brink. And, and looking at just the differences in value when I look at the, the better cattle in terms of genetics and the, and the cattle on the other end of the spectrum and, and just the real economic impact that, that really exists in our industry. And so if we can use these kind of tools to better identify
identify uh, those differences, better identify those cattle uh, that are gonna, gonna excel in our industry, uh, it really leads to a, a, a much better economic output uh, for our entire operations. So with the GeneMax test, we ultimately end up uh, with, with some different uh, benefits of it. The overall GeneMax score is a one to 100 uh, number. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, that kind of combines the contribution of both the marbling and the gain. The other thing that is really neat with GeneMax is if I'm using multi-sire pastures, and those bulls also happen to be tested with the HD50K test, we can most likely give you a pretty good indication of which calves are sired by, that, by an individual bull. And so that sire match component has been used uh, quite successfully by some folks out there as well to identify calves that might be sired by AI sires or, or calves that might be out of a particular bull that they, they're kind of wanting to get additional information or data on. This is, again, just a quick example of a, of a GeneMax report showing the overall GeneMax score, that 1 to 100 uh, score, which basically is just a percentile breakdown of that animal's uh, information. We have gain and marbling broken down. Those are in 1 to 5 buckets. Uh, uh, and so you have the ability to evaluate kind of by quintiles uh, where that animal fits for that individual trait. And then again, you can see off to the right, uh, the far right there, the ability on, on this particular set of calves to actually identify the bulls uh, uh, that those uh, those heifers in this case were actually sired by. And so it's exciting information. It, again, we're getting uh, more and more opportunities to, to see this technology used, and you're gonna get to hear from some of the folks that have used this technology uh, later on this evening. I think when we're dealing with uh, all of the selection tools that we've talked about, again, one of the things to keep in mind is uh, in our industry, we're maybe, we sometimes get caught up and focused on individual animals and trying to identify individual animals that are, that are superior. And those, those individual animals from a seed stock standpoint are the ones that we really make rapid movement, rapid gain with. But I think it's important to remember when we're using tools like this, tools like 50K testing, EPDs, GeneMax testing, we're, what we're really doing is moving the population. We're, we're moving that mean or shifting that mean and with that we take the entire population with us to, to make improvement for the particular traits that we're selecting for. These tools that we're talking about give us an opportunity to make that improvement, make that, that advancement at a much more rapid and, and much more confident pace, I think. Again, this may be a little hard to see, but I think it's, it's really important that we, we boil this down to the information that you have available in that sale catalog, the information that's available on every registered Angus animal that we see on the bottom of that screenshot. It ultimately has to tie to the important information that, uh, that keeps our industry going. And so, uh, when we can make relevant selection decisions that are going to impact the relevant economic pieces of our industry, we're going to be successful. We can compete with any protein product. We can compete with any country to produce high quality, highly desirable product that, that people all over the world are, are chasing after. And so I think we just, uh, in closing, want to keep that in mind that as we're making these decisions, let's, let's keep in mind what the end goal is, what the end product is that we're shooting for, and try to always have those decisions in mind as we're using this information. It's about 120 SNPs is what's on it, Joe. Yep. So it's a relatively small panel. Again, the 50K, 
test is, it's a $75 test. The GeneMax test is on a hundred and some markers is, is a, uh, is a $17 test. And so with those additional SNPs, you get more information and more accuracy. And I think that's one of the neat things about the technology. We see it continuing to evolve. Uh, what, Mark, a year ago, the, uh, the 50K test was $139. And so as we see volume and usage of this technology increase, we see efficiencies and, and see new technology and platforms being developed. We're gonna see this cost continue to improve and, and be able to get more information as we go down the road. No. Um, <laughs> Short, short answer. No, and, and this is a great example. You know, we, we first put genomics, uh, I mean our first foray into, the, into genomic testing was enhancing carcass EPDs with a very small panel that we first started with with, a, with Igenity uh, back in 2009, I believe. Uh, that was kind of followed up the use of ultrasound data. For quite some time we had an had a separate genetic evaluation for ultrasound and we still had a separate set of carcass EPDs and so the that carcass database was running separately and the ultrasound was was a different set of EPDs. Well in reality what what does uh, Brian Bertelson care about? He cares about harvest data, how those cattle uh, go through a plant, uh, what the the quality grade and yield grade is on those cattle. And so that's the economically relevant trait for that suite that we need to focus on. And so a few years ago, we took the ultrasound data and started applying it to the carcass EPDs as an indicator trait. So we're using uh, ultrasound measures on yearling bulls and yearling heifers to predict the carcass merit or, or put it on a, a harvest steer basis. And so in that scenario, that harvest data becomes very, very important. And so it's, uh, it's really the information that's economically relevant in our industry. Now along comes genomics. We're not training the genomics to the ultrasound data. We look at the genomics and improve the genomics based on that carcass database. And so collecting additional harvest data is very, very important. And luckily we've got some astute breeders who have continued to, to test young bulls, get additional carcass data, and so that information is very, very important. Phenotypic measures are not going to go away. They're still important. That 8 million weaning weights is still important when we go to train the genomic information for that particular trait. But the, the getting that information and using it and continuing to grow that database allows us to make those genomic predictors even more powerful, a higher correlation to that information. The bulls are, are sired by bulls that have been 50K tested and their, their dams were also. About 80 to 85 percent of the bulls in the sale have been genomic tested. And you know, Bill put up there those accuracy figures, you know, you talked about the .05 going to, to .23 and on some traits .3. I mean, that's the way you tell the difference because the majority of these cattle are embryo transfer calves. And, you know, we've, we've chosen to just present it on an accuracy basis rather than getting hung up that it's, you know, this one's 50K and this one isn't. We're moving more and more, and a lot of the people we're working with, um, you know, thanks to Zoetis, you know, we went to 139, can we hear 75? We're looking for 35, and we'll go to, to uh, 100%. Where's Kevin? <laughs> but um, we're moving more, and there's Kevin back there, and they've, they've been excellent to work with. Their, their results are... Are, are quite important to, to us. And I think the key, a lot of the folks that I visit with, you know, it's my job to make sure we're multiplying the correct ones. And it's just like, th that's what you're trying to do in your herds too. And so we, you know, I had a friend back there and they go, that's our slide up there, Bill Bowen. <laughs> but we're trying to make sure from a donor basis and a sire basis that we're multiplying what I call the Michael Jordans of the Angus breed.
And we, we will be about 100% genomic tested by next spring. So. I think, Mark, the one important thing, and you know, we, we do some genetic evaluation work for the Canadian Ang Association, for example. I went up there and did a meeting about a year ago, and they were really excited that someday they were going to have genomic enhanced EPDs. And I said, I'm sorry, but you guys already have them. Because, I mean, once these bulls start having genomic information put into the evaluation, everything out here has a genomic enhanced EPD, whether it's got it on that individual animal or not. And so we're using all of the information gathered across the breed. Uh, again, this, this coming week, we're going to add about 1,500 50K results will go into our one-week evaluation. And so you think about that, that, uh, I mean, two plus years ago, that all started with 2,500 uh, animals that went into to the original calibration. We had a couple weeks uh, this spring where we did 2,500 in a week. And so this is moving rapidly and we're getting better every day. Yeah, I don't know where, what that number is going to be for sure, Bill, but we see like in the, the, between the first and second calibration, we saw accuracies bump up there, kind of 0.05 to close to 0.1 on some traits. And so, yeah, we're going to continue to, to build. I mean, it's just like with uh, the, the new work we're doing now, I've seen a couple traits that Sally's got finished up on, and we're accounting for about 50% of the genetic variation with that genomic test on a, on a trait. And so that's huge. I mean, when we first started with this technology 10 years ago, they were talking about 1%, 2%, hopefully, hopefully that you were accounting for the genetic variation. We're going to be bumping 50% on several traits now.